Blonde arrives on Netflix, riding a wave of controversy. Based on Joyce Carol Oates' novel, both book and movie present a fictionalization account of the tragic life of iconic Hollywood star Marilyn Monroe. As she grapples with fame, mental illness, and the seemingly endless cruelty of those around her, not everyone is loving the movie, with some saying it revels in Monroe's misery. Though Anna de Armas' performance has been pretty universally praised, and because of the nature of production, it's tricky to disentangle facts from fiction. But don't worry, we're gonna give it the old college try. Content warning for some pretty upsetting subject matter. Mental illness is no joke. If you are struggling, please seek help. I'm Joey C. Let's go! One of the major emotional peaks in the early part of the movie comes with its portrayal of the intimate relationship between Marilyn Monroe and actors Charlie Chaplin Jr. and Edward G. Robinson Jr. The trio of young stars form a three-way that they call the Gemini, a passionate yet controversial three-way union that causes a scandal in Hollywood. It's so scandalous, in fact, that Marilyn is told in no uncertain terms that she needs to take precautions or risk ruining her career. It's pretty intense stuff, but it seems that the three-way was not particularly based in reality. Charlie Chaplin Jr. did claim in his autobiography that he had a short relationship with Monroe, and there have also been rumors that she had a separate, equal short-lived affair with Edward G. Robinson Jr., but there is no evidence whatsoever that the three were ever in a relationship together, and there's certainly no evidence that it was high-profile enough to be a major scandal. Come on, think of how prudish people were back then. If this really had happened, we'd be hearing about it for decades. And there's another aspect of that part of the film that doesn't stand up to scrutiny. Blonde actually goes as far as to suggest that Marilyn fell pregnant because of her intimate relationship with the three-way, and that she was forced into having a medical procedure to get rid of the unborn child. In fact, the film suggests that more than once she was forced into these procedures against her will, often by studio mandate, with unseen execs clearly concerned that being a mother would have an effect on her bankability as a star. The thing is, while studios certainly did get up to some pretty horrific stuff like that back in the day, there doesn't seem to be any evidence that Marilyn Monroe ever went through this procedure in real life, against her will or not. Obviously, the fact that the three-way is fictional means that the pregnancy is also fictional, and the movie is clearly making a point about how Monroe wasn't in full control of her body or her choices, which is a worthwhile point to make, even if we're not sure if it needed to be this graphic. But if we're looking at the cold hard facts, it looks like this is another fictionalization. However, it is well documented that Marilyn Monroe suffered multiple miscarriages while she was married to playwright Arthur Miller, and as per tradition, more on that later. After showing us Norma Jean's traumatic childhood, the movie jumps forward in time to a young adult Marilyn auditioning for a role in All About Eve, her first on-screen performance. During the audition, she is assaulted by a figure known as Mr. Z. Although she leaves in tears and feeling violated, she later finds out that she got the part. It is likely that the character of Mr. Z is known to be Daryl F. Zanuck, the founder and head of 20th Century Fox. Now, it's fairly widely known at this point that Zanuck had some Weinstein-esque tendencies. And Monroe herself was pretty candid about the often derogatory and degrading treatment she suffered on various casting couches. The real Marilyn tried her best to maintain her dignity, even when powerful men tried to take it away. She famously said Hollywood is a place where they'll pay you $1,000 for a kiss and 50 cents for your soul. I know because I turned down the first offer often enough and held out for the 50 cents. Pretty classy. We'll think you'll agree. Near the end of the movie, we see an intoxicated Marilyn Monroe taken roughly off of a plane by Secret Service agents and pretty much dragged to President John F. Kennedy's room. In Monroe's own words, she's treated like meat to be delivered. According to the scene, she's basically there to service the president's needs, to be used and abused as necessary, and then thrown away while he deals with important political business. It's a harrowing scene in a movie full of harrowing scenes, but it also seems to be another case of the movie opting for a fictionalized, heightened version of real-life events. Of course, it has been rumored for decades that Monroe had an affair with Kennedy, and with his brother Bobby. Her rendition of Happy Birthday, Mr. President is probably the most famous birthday song of all time, after all. But there's so much innuendo, gossip, and conflicting reports about their relationship that it's hard to fully pin down what happened. The only reliably team of witnesses happened at Bing Crosby's Rancho Mirage, where guests suggested that they were having a good time together. 
Of course, the movie is making another point about powerful men and their treatment of women. Whatever the details of Monroe's real life relationship with the president was, it is unsure if it was as brutal and as one-sided as it's depicted in the movie. The unsettling early scenes of the film show young Norma Jean trying to deal with the erratic behavior of her mother Gladys, a clearly disturbed woman. Gladys is physically abusive, attempting to drive them both into the infamous 1933 Griffith Park fire striking her daughter and even attempting to drown her in a scalding hot bath. The little girl is taken away by the neighbors and later put into care, while her mother was taken into a psychiatric hospital for treatment. So, how much of this is true? A lot of it, it turns out. Gladys was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia after a major mental breakdown in 1934, and she did spend the rest of her life in and out of institutions. However, there is no evidence about the bathtub drowning incident. Sadly, before you get too relieved, there was reportedly a separate incident where Norma's maternal grandmother, Della, attempted to smother the infant Norma with a pillow, raging that she had been born out of wedlock. The poor kid really couldn't catch a break, even as a baby. Much of the new movie is told with a surreal, almost impressionalistic style, and that comes down to the character names as well. Monroe's first and second on-screen husbands, for example, are not referred to by their names, but as the ex-athlete and the playwright. Well, in reality, those two husbands were actually her second and third. Monroe married her first husband, James Doherty, in 1942 when she was just 16 years old, mostly to avoid going back into care. However, Doherty is not mentioned in the movie. More to the point, those two unnamed husbands were actually pretty famous. The ex-athlete was legendary baseball player Joe DiMaggio, and his discomfort with the filming of Monroe's iconic billowing skirt scene in the seven-year itch was reportedly very real. The playwright, meanwhile, was Arthur Miller, author of Death of a Salesman, with whom Marilyn spent a relatively happy period of her life with. The movie is pretty sympathetic to Miller, though in reality it has been suggested that he was way more condescending and derogatory towards Monroe in real life, writing less than flattering things about her and leaving them out for her to find. Not classy, we'll think you'll agree. In one scene in Blonde, Monroe's husband, Joe DiMaggio, aka the ex-athlete, is approached by Charlie Chaplin Jr. and Edward G. Robinson Jr., the other two members of the threesome which we've already established was fictional. They present him with nude photographs of Monroe that were taken early in her career in an attempt to blackmail DiMaggio, leading to a scene where the jealous ex-athlete attacks Monroe in a rage. Now, there very well may have been attempts to blackmail Monroe in real life. Famous people get blackmailed all the time, after all. But this particular incident, entirely fictionalized, as far as we can see. After all, if the threesome itself wasn't real, the blackmail couldn't exactly be real, could it? It doesn't seem to be based on any real event. Blonde portrays much of Monroe's marriage to Arthur Miller as pretty content, even idyllic, though she still suffers from self-esteem and confidence issues. But the beginning of the downward spiral for the couple, at least in the movie, comes when a pregnant Monroe falls over at the beach in front of some visiting friends, resulting in a graphic and harrowing miscarriage. It's pretty upsetting, but it also represents a bit of a divergence from what happened to the real Monroe. She was plagued by multiple miscarriages throughout her marriage to Miller, which was a major factor and them drifting apart, and in Monroe's escalating depression. But the fall on the beach seems to be a convenient dramatic invention. In reality, her 1957 pregnancy was ectopic, and she was rushed to the hospital and underwent surgery. She also suffered a miscarriage the following year, though, again, we don't think that was due to her falling over on the beach. We're also pretty sure that she didn't hear the voices of her unborn child. We don't really know the amount of mental illness the beautiful Marilyn was subjected to, although it is a possibility she heard the voices, we're just going to consider this creative freedom taken in the film. The billowing skirt shot from the seven year itch may be the single most iconic image of Marilyn Monroe in popular culture, but we'd put her appearance in Some Like It Hot a close second. The movie is an acknowledged classic, a masterpiece of comedy, and it's a fantastic performance from an actress who is often pretty underrated. In Blonde, however, the filming of Some Like It Hot is presented as a tense and volatile affair, with Monroe throwing screaming tantrums, clawing at her own face, shouting at the director Billy Wilder, and complaining that the role is demeaning and even storming off set and needing to be sedated. As a portrayal of declining mental health, it's effective, but in reality, while Monroe did have some difficulties 
difficulties filming the movie due to ill health, she was actually very proud of her script and her performance. And despite her frequent absences, which sometimes did affect production, her co-stars were generally very supportive and complimentary of the blonde bombshell. Well, apart from Tony Curtis, but that's a story for another video. A reoccurring motif throughout Blonde are the letters that Monroe's absent father sends her. She never met her father as a child or as an adult and spends years searching for him, hanging off every word that he writes in the letters. Desperate to connect with her father figure, always hopeful that he's going to come back into her life, though he always puts it off. She's so desperate, in fact, that she frequently calls the men in her life, Daddy. Now, some of this is certainly true. The real-life Marilyn Monroe never met her father, though it's widely agreed now that he was probably Charles Stanley Gifford, who worked above her mother Gladys in RKO Pictures, and had an affair with her that resulted in the birth of Norma Jean. And that missing piece of her family puzzle certainly had an impact on her for the rest of her life. However, in the movie, one of the final scenes suggests that the letters from her father were, in fact, fabricated written by Charlie Chaplin Jr., aka one of the two men in the fictional threesome. It's a strange and unsettling addition, but most likely completely false. We don't know if there were any letters at all, let alone fake ones. An effective fabrication or not, sound off in the comments. Ladies and gentlemen and everybody else in between, you made it to the end of the video. What did you think of Blonde? Did it accurately represent Marilyn's life? Let us know in the comments below, and as always everybody, Thanks for watching.